Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we have a wonderful evening planned for everyone and I'm going to turn it over to Sandy to make our introductions. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us. Happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. My name is Sandy Castillo and I'm a co-lead for the IDA committee within the Student Congress of Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service. Our committee is focused on the work of inclusivity, diversity, equity, and anti-racism with a special focus on anti-Black racism. We do this work both within and outside of our Fordham community, and we are so glad to see so many folks here this evening. If you're a part of our student community at Fordham and are interested in joining our monthly meetings, we will share the info on how to get involved at the end of the panel. We would, we would like to start this evening off with a moment of silence honoring the life and work of Dr. King. So if you'll join me for a moment of silence with our microphones off. Thank you for joining us for that. A few housekeeping notes before we introduce this evening's panelists, we'd like to remind everyone to keep their microphones on mute while we hold our panel. We will have Q&A at the end, so please feel free, feel free to drop questions in the chat feature throughout the panel with the word question at the beginning in all capital letters. We will get to them in the order that they come with an eye for a diverse range of questions. Please allow us the editorial freedom to combine questions that may be getting at similar themes. Without further ado, we'd like to begin by playing the trailer for this evening's film, I Am Not Your Negro. Before I do, we, while we at the ID, IDA committee um, believe that these conversations about racism and white supremacy are imperative to have, we acknowledge that these themes and topics can be incredibly triggering, especially for individuals of color. Please be advised that the following trailer contains language that may be traumatic for some. And also, if you haven't had a chance to watch the film, um, please note that you can watch the film for free on canopy.com, Netflix, and, on, and, in your, um, and using your New York public library or any public library. Oh, the audio is not working, Stephanie. Possible is done to make an example of this bad nigga so they won't be any more like him. The story of the Negro in America, of America, it is not a pretty story. Most of white Americans I've ever encountered surely have nothing whatever against Negroes. That's really not the question. Really, kind of apathy and ignorance. You don't know what's happening on the other side of the world because you don't want to know. In America, I was free only in battle, but never free to rest. We need to take action, any kind of action, by any means necessary. They needed us to speak to Kaku, and now they don't need us anymore. Now that they don't need us, they're going to kill us all off. <laughs> There are days when you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it. I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. The question you've got to ask yourself, the white population of this country has got to ask itself, is why it was necessary to have a nigger in the first place. Because I'm not a nigger. I'm a man. But if you think I'm a nigger, means you need it. You gotta find out why. And the future of the country depends on that.
Um, tonight, we have invited four panelists to discuss the themes raised by the film, and our discussion will be moderated by my fellow co-lead, Ilona Silva. Uh, our, sorry. Um, we are uh, joined today uh, by Dr. Leah Richards Palmeter, LCSW. Uh, Dr. R Richards Palmeter champions the practice of cultural competency, both in her role at Marywood University and as a member of the board of directors for the Wright Center for Graduate Medical Education. Holding the core beliefs that all patients should be treated with dignity, Dr. Richard Palmeter aims to instill these values in young learners as Director of Diversity at Marywood University. Dr. Richard Palmeter joined the Wright Center Board to ensure the organization fulfills its mission of delivering healthcare that meets the unique social, cultural, and the linguistics needs of the community it serves. She is also committed to mentoring those in underrepresented groups within her community and works with the Greater Scranton Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, as well as the local 4-H club. Dr. Brenda M. Green is also joining us this evening. Dr. Green has committed her life to teaching, learning, and scholarship. She is founder and executive director of the Center for Black Literature at Medgar Evers College and is director of the National Black, Black Writers Conference at Medgar Evers College. Her research and scholarly work includes composition, African-American literature, and multicultural literature. Dr. Green, known as a literary activist, has served as director of literacy and writing programs for youth and adults, and has been a jurist for professional and literary organizations. Most notably through Center for Black Literature, Dr. Green has consistently pursued her passion of enriching the public's knowledge and appreciation of the value of the literature produced by Black writers. She is also the host of the long running weekly program, Writers on Writing, heard on New York's WNE 91.5 FN and globally online. Dr. Green has received many awards, including the Zora Neale Hurston Literary Award and has been inducted into the International Literary Hall of Fame for writers of African descent. It was announced in 2021 that Dr. Green was appointed as one of the members of the CUNY Planning Commission on Black Race and Ethnic Studies. Finally, we have Janaka Bauman Lewis, PhD. Dr. Lewis is, associate, is an Associate Professor of English and Director of the Center for the Study of the New South at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She is the author of Freedom Narratives of African American Women and Three Children's Books, Brown All Over, Bold Nia Marie Passes the Test, and co author of Dr. King is Tired Too. She is a co creator of a joint family Charlotte based educational service company, Backpack Plus Family Resources, and founder of the Vanilla Bauman Foundation for Educational Impact, based in Georgia and the Carolinas. She is also the co-founder and facilitator of Charlotte-based Justice and Care and Everyday Action Consulting. Panelists, welcome and thank you so much for being here with us this evening. At this time, I will turn it over to my co-lead, Ilona. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, and thank you everyone for being here on a very important day in our calendar, um, Dr. Martin Luther King's day. Um, so without further ado, let's go with um, the first question. We in the IDEA committee have come up with these questions and then um, we will open it up for all the attendees. Um, so uh, at this time, we, we want you to write down anything that you would have, you would like to make a question, but hold it until we go through ours. And then if your question was not answered, um, we will ask you to put them on the chat. Um, 
the first question we have is Baldwin says the country to which you owe your life and your identity has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. Uh, this question is for all of you guys. Um, as a professional and in your own work, how do you make space for yourself as a Black woman? And I'm just going to go from left to right in the order I see them. And so, um, Dr. Richard Palmetier, I see you first. Well, thank you very much for the question. I want to thank um, the IDEA um, Council and students for putting this on and, and really it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to be in presence of women, strong women and strong women of color. So I just wanted to put that out there and sort of to, to answer that, it sort of connects with my response. So in my professional work um, over the last 20 years as um, in higher education, I have been like one of the only people of color on my um, in, at my institution and employed. So I have learned through those two decades that I actually look to always try to fight. I feel that there's always sort of like a, a fight that that's coming. Um, so I so my identity has been sort of like an advocate as a fighter. Um, as I'm getting older, though, I'm learning that um, although I tend to want to always, you know, use the hammer and see everything as a nail in terms of, you know, equity, diversity and inclusion, that my listening skills as a social worker are helping me to um, sort of evolve and transition um, into uh, someone who uses a hammer when I need to and sort of use the honey when I need to as well. So um, that's my, my short and quick response. Thank you. I love it. Thank you so much. So meaningful. <laughs> and Dr. Green, you're next on my view. Thank you for inviting me on this very special day because unfortunately we are still, still have to realize the dream of, Mager, of Martin Luther King around fighting on white supremacy. And this day also has a special meaning to me because I was one of 200 students in 1968 to get a, a full tuition scholarship at New York University and that was because black students and black faculty got together and advocated after King was murdered. So this always has um, a special meaning um, for me. Um, when I thought about this question, I thought about what in my life, when you recognizing that I am always and have always been subjected to racism and to sexism as a black woman in higher education, as a black woman in this nation, and I have to reconcile the different roles that I carry, which are educator, scholar, mother, grandmother. These roles um, are, are continually with me and it becomes my goal to reconcile those roles in, in the spaces that I have. So I've worked on creating spaces where I ask questions and live a life that is the examined life. And um, I'm committed to raising the awareness of young people who have been victims of mis miseducation and who don't know their history and their literature. I'm committed to working in an institution like Megar Evers College. I specifically chose Megar Evers College, a predominantly Black college, because it embodied the values that I believe in and that had a moral commitment to black and brown people and to this community. Um, Marita Golden talks about the, she wrote recently in a book, The Strong Black Woman, and she talks about how we wear masks. And I think of myself as wearing a mask continuously. That's what we do um, as women in the world because the mask allows us to tell the world that we can do whatever is needed and sometimes we have to keep things to ourselves, but we keep that mask on fortified with that we can survive anything. 
myth of the strong black woman is, is really not a myth, it's reality. And I just accept it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Such powerful words. I just love that you all were able to come. And Dr. Lewis, you are next in my view. And I wanna echo the thanks for the invitation and sharing space. And I'm in here writing down notes even um, as comments are being shared. So thank you for that. Um, thinking about space making specifically and um, re-watching the film uh, was also a reminder of spaces that have not been made for uh, specifically as black women. Um, even as Baldwin talked about, you know, our women, men and our children and you know this like metaphorical nation belonging but knowing that we have not always belonged and still have to fight to make that space and so um he talks about uh, writing uh remember this house about the lives of Martin Luther King and Medgar Evers and Malcolm X that he only got about 30 pages into um and thinking about this house really as a metaphor for the space and the place that we have to make having to tell our stories um because we can't rely on anyone to do that for us. And so that's been um, my work in freedom narratives of African-American women. And even in my children's books, what are the stories that aren't um, circulating that are about the positivity and the power um, of Black women and girls? And so just continuing through work, through um, community education, and also through scholarship to tell those stories that aren't going to be told by anybody else. Thank you so much. And I think you all touched on to our next question, which is Baldwin says the line that separates a witness from an actor is thin. He explains that for him, joining is to approve of a cause and its messaging. And so he always maintained it as a witness. When you hear the words witness or actor, what do those words evoke for you today? And we can, any of you can unmute and go. Can I jump in? I uh, know I just talked. <laughs> okay. So um, something that resonated with me because it uh, relates right here to Charlotte is um, Baldwin talking about seeing um, Dorothy Counts integrating um, Harding High School from Paris. And um, you know we know that story here in Charlotte, but looking at those images, and saying somebody should have been there with her and then deciding to come back. And so to me, that's the difference between witnessing and activism, seeing and saying, oh, somebody really ought to be that person there and then becoming that person there. And so often we're looking at things and saying, what a shame, but instead thinking, you know, what actions need to be taken and what actions do we need to take? And that, so that's that difference um, for me. You know, when I when I saw the question, I immediately thought about a book I read years ago um, by the Trinidadian writer Earl Lovelace. It's called "It's Just a Movie," and it's a metaphor that our life is like a movie, and and it's also aligns with the theme that our life is like theater. And so, in this theater of life, we are producers, and we're performers, and we're actors, and um, we're witnesses, and we bear witness. And so, as as producers. And in, in our work, when I produce events, when I produce conferences and seminars and workshops and um, set up forums for people to talk, I am creating a space for an audience to bear witness. O in, on that stage, you also have actors who are performing and who are enacting the part and who are um, writing and, and um, distributing, exhibiting activism. So you have a, a space where you have the producers who um, end up creating that space. You have the actors and performers on stage in life who are ensuring that that knowledge gets conveyed. And then you have the audience who's bearing witness. And I think in the work that I do, and I imagine that many of us do, we end up shape-shifting. We go in between different roles. But it becomes important that we continue to make sure that we are integrating those roles, that we are engaged in activism. It's why I call myself a literary activist and we're creating those spaces where people can bear witness. And that was what struck me in his film about bearing a witness and telling a story. He is so good at telling stories. 
And people connect to you more when you tell the story, when you make it a story and you make it personal and you give them reasons to, to um, understand in a deeper way. That resonated with me as well. I mean, as you're talking about telling stories and, and you know, hopefully some of you, you know, on this um, Zoom, you're social workers. And I think we're mostly trained to do a lot of action, right? And finding resources, meeting people where they are in the moment, person in environment. So what I try to do is give enough of the backstory so that um, people have this understanding and this foundation. So they have witnessed, you know, and, and understand that, but then are very moved to action. And that's what I find sort of in higher ed and with all of my students and all the classes that I teach, trying to get them to act. Um, is, but they need the right kinds of information and then bringing in, especially, you know, sort of our histories, the people of color, right? and um, having them understand what those histories have been because a lot of us haven't been taught all of that history. Um, and so getting access to those points so that you can understand it so then you can be moved to action. So ditto with what um, my fellow panelists have said. Thank you so much. Um, so now we go into the part of the movie where he talks about other people. So. It, it looks like for white supremacy, the leaders that he talks about, Martin, uh, Mega Ebers, um, and Malcolm X, are shaped into radical archetypes. And however, we know in feminist theory that radicalism is necessary for change. So what is your take on radicalism? Somebody has to mute themselves. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I want to I want to jump into that. I did um, a I wrote a paper recently about Hakeem Mahabudi, who is the founder and and president of Third World Press, and he's also a poet. And about how he embodies um, radicalism. So if you look at the term radical, it means getting at the root cause of something. And um, it's a way to dismantle oppression. So our artists, going back to our artists, our performers, our writers have always been engaged in, rattle, in, in radicalism. And radicalism can also be thought about as struggle. In fact, um, our, our upcoming conference, just a plug for our conference, is called The Beautiful Struggle, Black Writers Lighting the Way. It's going to be at Maker Rivers College virtually from March 30th through April 2nd but it encompasses the theme that life is a struggle. And Megar Evers College represents radicalism. Mar Malcolm, Martin and King represent radical radicalism. Um, James Baldwin wanted to tell their stories. He wanted to tell the stories of our radical thinkers. And we don't normally think about Megar as, as being um, radical. So at, at Mega Rivers College, I wanna also just give a shout out to our new president, the first female president, Mega Rivers College, Dr. Patricia um, Ramsey, but we have centers that advocate um, a form of radical, radicalism. We have the Center for Black Literature, the Center for Law and Social Justice, the Du Bois Bunch Center, the Caribbean Research Center. We have programs um, that have, um, ways to engage students in, in really intellectually um, stimulating questions that, that ask them about to look at social justice and racial, um, ra racial equality. And I, I also thought about Douglas was a radical. And when he said, power can seize nothing without a demand and basically without struggle. So if you look at radicalism and struggle, and dismantling systems that are in place. Radicalism is very necessary and we should not be afraid to say that word. I agree wholeheartedly. And the thing about um, radical creativity is so much of what has shaped um, our existence in America, radical responses, radical love, radical healing. I mean, everything we've done um, in spite of um, has been, been radical. So I love uh, Dr. Green that you talked about going to the root because it's pulling from everything in us sometimes to be able to um, respond, exist and survive. But to answer the question, I believe radicalism is necessary. 
It absolutely is. I mean, to echo what my co-panelists have said. And I also feel that this is a, an inroads to also getting allies, um, especially sort of when, when you think of um, what has happened, how the three men, well, then James Baldwin and telling their stories and, and having that movie, you know, sort of tightly woven together. But this is sort of where you can get people who've had targets on their backs too, to understand, you know, it's just throw off the patriarchy, right? And, and everyone understands that, that patriarchy, um, who've had the, the, the sign on their back. So um, this is where you can create some allies, but um, all three men in their own unique ways. And it's interesting that, that you know, three men from just <laughs> sort of their walks of lives, I mean, they were exceptional in what they did, but any of us could also be, I mean, as we, you know, continue sort of this legacy and this fight, right? And that's, I think, what we're called to do. Thank you so much. I love that you all were totally on the same page. Um, so, so much the film examines the different ways of communicating the same message, um, just like you all were saying. Um, there's always going to be criticisms when you challenge white supremacy. I think many of us have already experienced that. Now, how have you all particularly held space to work with different messages that may ultimately be pushing towards the same destination, whether it's in your in your work life or in your personal life. Um, if you can give us some some examples or some advice. I'll jump in. Um, I, I think it's important that we understand the importance of of having unity. We can come at it in different ways. But if you're, we're unified around a particular goal, then we can affect change. And I think a perfect example is what's going on now with, with getting people to come together around the voter suppression acts, you know, about around what this, the Republicans are doing. If we can get on the same page and help people to really understand the impact of that and what will happen if we do nothing, we have to become um, radical about that. And I think about the principle which um, particularly we have a responsibility and collectively we can and can work and we have to think outside of the box creativity um, I think about faith we have to we can't be pessimistic I mean there's one point in the film where James Bowen talks about I'm not pessimistic because I'm alive so we can't be pessimistic we have to have faith and we have to think about what other organizations we can work with And I, I always say to my colleagues that, that we create a win-win situation when we partner with other organizations around their programming and we cross promote events. We, we work with PEN America, with the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. We work with different caucuses of our professional organizations. We, we make sure that we're documenting our work so that people can view it. Um, we document all of our literary programs on our, on our website at the Center for Black Literature. So we understand that, that we have to create this goal and we have to understand that there are different ways of, of coming together. I'll jump in if you don't mind, Dr. Lewis. Um, so going off that, and again, sort of with our, our social work as a foundation, right, and understanding people and, and sort of the environments and everything that they're connected with. And James Baldwin also talked about um, knowing sort of the white majority better than they knew themselves. So having that, that extra sort of added learning and, and, and facilitation. And, and so what I try to do is in all of my classes, every single one is work with people around sort of implicit bias, self-awareness, and look for opportunities to impact them at where they are. But, but also understanding that this is uncomfortable and, and, and encouraging people to push through that. And sometimes I even hate the word, it's an uncomfortable discussion. Um, it's a needed discussion, right? But giving people sort of these supports Right and, and challenges like come on you you can get through it and you should and and that's where sort of the, the beauty and the goal is 
getting through it. Um, so I, I think those are some of the ways to, to get the same message across. And, but again, trying to meet people where they are and then encouraging them, come on a little bit more and then having them sort of to share with, with other people and in community and not doing this alone. Um, so I think those are some other, you know, sort of opportunities and spaces that, that we can create and have created. And I agree with community being key, but also acknowledging that proximity of experiences. So for example, um, if white people have a conversation about race, it's framed as brave or courageous. If African-Americans, black people have a conversation about race, it's, you know, anger or rage. And I have a whole line about righteous rage, why it's, it's necessary to, you know, to talk about rage and others have um, as well. And so acknowledging that it's not a surprise or that it's not normal that um, we are still <laughs> experiencing many of the things that we've experienced, you know, for decades, even for, for centuries. And so, um, and it resonated in the film when Baldwin said, you know, um, that white people were, were astounded by what happened in Birmingham and black people were not. <laughs> and so just this idea of how is it so for and to, you know, one, part of the population and it's because that proximity of experience is is not acknowledged and so just continuing to to do that as part of the work as well exactly that, I just, oh i'm sorry yeah, can I, ahead, one? I think that's too why january 6th a year ago i mean i think for black folk i i don't think or people of color i don't think it was a surprise um i think we understood where that came from and comes from active disbelief right <laughs> so well he, he said um Baldwin also said the story of the negro in america is the story of america you cannot tell the story of america without telling the story of i'm putting negro that's the words he used but you cannot story tell the story of our country without including the story of, of blacks in america and and if people understood that i think that would be that would help to, to move along that path where people would understand the interconnectedness, but there's so much resistance to that. And that's a perfect segue for our next question. Um, Baldwin says, the Negro has never been as docile as white Americans wanted to believe. That was a myth. We were not singing and dancing down the levee. We were trying to keep alive. We were trying to survive a very brutal system. So again, as a professional in your own fields, which systems have historically influenced, historically influenced by white supremacist ideology, do you believe need more attention in today's society? For example, we can have um, the education system, which you're all involved in some way, shape, or form, or the criminal justice system, the health system, and many more, and why? All of the above. <laughs> but I wanna yes, acknowledge- Yes, exactly. <laughs> I wanna acknowledge the complicity in the educational system um, specifically, and I'm glad you said that because it's always been a story of access, who has financial resources, who has you know, educational resources, who can get in, who is supported, and so that's one that, you know, I think we continue to be um, complicit in, even while acting from, from the inside. And so um, there's a quote of the movie where Baldwin says, these people had deluded themselves so long they don't think I'm humid. And then says, you know, they and themselves have become more monsters. And I'm thinking within all of these systems, how are students of color, how are those who are entrapped in carceral systems made to be the monsters when it's actually those who are acting against them um, that, you know, are playing that role. And so all of the above, but specifically, you know, always thinking about how we're acting within the system in which we work. Yeah, I want to jump as I was going to also, of course, as, as educators, we're all speaking of that, but I think um, one of the, the the experiences that I've had is I've taught every level. I've taught preschool, elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, graduate school, I've taught them all. So I know really it's very dear to my heart what is happening 
um, in the educational system and how many students are being, um, have been miseducated. And I think that we really need to look at our teachers. Our teachers are our role models. The key is the teachers. Um, the teachers are the ones who can bring up these issues of race and related issues in the curriculum. This is what we do in, in one of our programs called Re-Envisioning Our Lives Through Literature. They can make sure that there are classes that represent um, diversity and provide students with a curriculum that's full, a full portrayal of the complexity. The teachers who are role models for our students. Um, I, I taught a graduate course at NYU. And one of the first questions I would ask is, Imagine most of the students were Midwestern. They were going into the public school system where you're white. They had no idea what it would be to teach in an inner city school. And I said, imagine that you are the only white person in a predominantly black environment and what would you feel like? So there's a, a need for, for empathy, um, the need to imagine what it's like to be the other. And I think we have to really have deeper conversations about what's meant by critical race theory. Now, people have taken that and equated that with, oh, you we shouldn't be teaching black studies or black literature. Critical race theory is a complicated theory that looks at why, our, why we have laws that are against racism and they're still being used to um, support systemic racial structures. That's not what we're saying when we want to expand the curriculum and we want more black studies and we want students to study black and brown authors. We, we need to have students see themselves in other ways. And so part of what we have to do is to have teachers who aren't afraid to get students to ask critical questions. And I have this theory, I said, imagine, if we all imagine as educators that the students in our classroom were our sons and daughters. That would change our perception of what we're doing. Because what we do for our sons and daughters is so much more than what we do for um, students in our classroom. And I know that I'm, being, I'm generalizing, but I'm talking about the need to have teachers who go into teaching because they have a calling and because they're passionate about it. I think that ends up being um, a starting point for changing what's happening in our school system. Absolutely, I concur. Um, I This movie and um, the book that I've read recently in like the last six months is Some of It All by Heather McGee. And I like how she sort of frames everything. I mean, because a lot of times, a lot of people, especially white folk, can get you know sort of upset about the slavery issue. And in her book, takes the slavery issue out at the knees and speaks about sort of the housing crisis and um, how then white people um, decided that they themselves would not um, support programs that could have benefited them in addition to people of color because it benefited people of color. So it, it has a whole new focus on, on sort of the actions and behaviors um, that happen. And, I, and I, I think she posits that, you know, if everyone had like a decent equitable housing, that a lot of these um, systems would, you know, would be problems no longer. So that's a book that I would recommend for, for people to read. Um, and as both you know, my co-panelists you know, spoke to sort of the education, all the above, the criminal justice system is just abhorrent. I mean, we, that is, we have to wrap our minds around what is going on. Um, and you know, just in the most recent couple of weeks or last week, you know, several people exonerated after spending, you know, 30 and 40 years in jail of crimes they'd never committed, but only just because they were black. Um, so, and this is just last week. So we, we have many, there's 52 weeks in a year. So this happens all the time. So ditto with my co-panelists. Thank you so much for your very thorough answers. So here we come to something that I think you all touched as well with, within your answers. Baldwin emphasizes that this work is white work. However, people of color are continuously asked to dismantle this system. 
do you contend or wrestle with this inherited burden of abolition that it isn't yours to abolish? We would not be where we were if, if, if we just said, leave it up to white people. You know, we have, we have movements, we're going back to the abolitionist movements, you're going back to what happened during Jim Crow, the civil rights, Black Lives Matter. We have to have coalitions. We have to work together because attacks on democracy affect all of us. So we cannot leave it up to one group to address that. Um, we all have a role. We have to be unified across race and ethnic studies, ethnics, ethnicity, and religion. And we, we have to accept our society is one that is constructed by race. And once we acknowledge this and we realize that if we want to become radical, um, if we want to affect change, if we want to be transformative um, agents, we have a lot of work to do and we have to be persistent in calling on others to work alongside of us. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. We're we're all in this together. And this is where, you know, sort of the question that it relates back to being a witness or an actor, right? So um, getting helping people to understand the need to act and the places to act and the coalitions, um, because power, the unity, um, having a lot of people come together. So I agree. I agree as well, but and also acknowledging that burden of the work. I mean, I think one of the most radical things that we do is exist and continue to exist and still show up and still exist and still survive. And I think about, you know, having conversations um, with my grandmother when I was a child and, you know, her talking about um, going to college as an adult, um, raising my dad dad and my uh, and my aunt and you know working in a cafeteria in Albany Georgia um, when Dr. King came to Albany and he found it one of the most hateful and racist places he had ever been and my grandmother telling me you know I wanted my children to see me get an education despite and she you know made them walk everywhere because they didn't have a car and she refused to let them ride segregated bus and so thinking about even these um, intergenerational conversations that help us to continue to show up because somebody else did it. And so although, yeah, it's, it's not our burden, it's still our work, um, you know, together, but not just in isolation, also with those who came before us and who shared their stories too. Thank you so much. So I there's a clear seduction in white supremacy. And do you guys think that liberation can also be seductive? How are you finding seductive? So if you look at, you know, if you look at seductive as, as getting people to become passionate and really committed to making change, then liberation work can be seductive. And then the challenge is how do we get people to become passionate? Mm -hmm. But you know, when I think of seductive, I always I think of it in, in more sexual terms. But if you think about, you know, getting people energized and passionate and, and moved and inspired, then we can do that through a variety of ways so in forums such as this, you know, and in films and discussions in our classrooms, we can make it seductive. So we, we create something where everyone wants to get on board. I agree. And I think America has always been seduced by, you know, liberation and justice, just not for everybody. And so thinking about, you know, that justice for all as being the, the piece of what one can't have it if everybody doesn't have it. Um, I think it is an enticing idea and one that we have been in love with and committed to just not in practice. And so that for all part is the part that, that needs to be the, the seductive part. Yeah, agree. And thank you. I mean, we need to get away from the whole, the picture of the pie, right? Because mm -hmm. there is pie for everybody. So, um, and, and if we can have then these goals, you know, sort of be more seductive and, and get people um, enthused around those, those results very, very definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Um, 
so this is our last question. Um, the film closes on such sovereign sadness, but there's still some hope. Baldwin says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. He also says, I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive, which one of you has quoted before. He states that the ultimate goal of his work is for people to understand why the other is necessary, just like you mentioned with the pieces of the pie. What is your main charge in your work? Um, and there's a lot of social workers here, so I'm gonna direct first this question to Dr. Um, Richard Palmitier. Thank you very much. And what, what I try to do in my classes and my work with my students, and regardless of what you know the, the class description says, is really have them understand themselves. So doing some self-awareness and understanding implicit bias, understanding sort of values and beliefs, like having them, because I, I found in some of my teaching that some white students don't know who, who they are or what they are, right? They've just existed and no one has asked those questions of them. So having them do some work and some deep digging around those kinds of issues, I help, I, I believe help them have this self-awareness that, um, that there are other things and there are um, battles to be fought and to be won and, and working with other folks. So um, I do that work in order to address, you know, th this question and having people um, understand what else is needed and, and sort of the truths that exist, right? As I mentioned before, not knowing about American history, not knowing that these things happened, um, not knowing sort of the native lands we occupy, not not having that and really work to have people understand that. So then they know their place and their role and their responsibility to sort of move the line further down the path. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Um, you know, as, as I said, I, I am um, I'm a professor of English and also um, as, as the executive director of the Center for Black Literature, my goal is really supporting the artists. And I think one of the things um, going back to being an activist is that we have to embrace activism on all levels. And our artists, our writers, our poets, our musicians, they are the visionaries. Um, we can recognize that art is a means of engaging other students, other people, and it can be transformative in the lives of, of our community. So I, I would say my goal is using the arts to help people to transform their lives, recognizing that our artists really are in many ways the, the, the uh, carrying forth the tradition of the griots from Africa, they, they're our visionaries. They're the voices of conscience. Um, they are the ones who are the leaders in a movement. If you look at what happened in, in the Black Lives Matter movement, many of them were the artists, um, the activists. So we have to support programs that support the arts and that get people to engage in a meaningful way. We have to make sure that those programs are in our schools and we have to continually find forums so that um, people can have ways and venues to express this. You know, our society is multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, and people have their own cultural legacy to carry forth. So we have to ensure that our young people um, know their legacy, and we have to ensure that we are continually affirming the legacy of people, because as they say, if you do not know your history, you are doomed to repeat it. That's the way to liberation. I feel like that's the last word right there. <laughs> and I just concur, Black women's stories have never ceased to exist. And so my work in education is just about asserting that existence. Um, we, in spite of, despite, you know, et cetera, our stories have always existed. And so continuing to tell and pass those stories on. 
Thank you. This has so many implication, implications for um, field work in social work as well, um, in clinical, in medso, and especially in macro work. Um, so we have some questions that have been coming in through the chat. Um, we've also put some of the information that um, the three of you have provided um, on the chat as well. Um, so the first question we have from John Cox for Dr. Lewis or anyone else. But can you talk more, more about Lorraine Has Hansberry? Uh -huh. The scenes um, with her were great, but everyone should know more about her. So take it away, Dr. Lewis. Absolutely. And I know I'm not the only one on this panel who can speak um, to her work, but when we think about radical creativity, uh, Lorraine Hansberry is one who, who definitely stands out. Um, she was mentioned in the, in the film in terms of the conversations um, with Bobby Kennedy about advocating for um, support for those who are integrating schools. And um, we know her as you know, author of um, a playwright. Uh, Raising in the Sun, which we can have a whole conversation about that while we're paying attention to kind of the Black man's fight. What about the sister who is getting education and um, finding her way, the, the wife, the mother? Um, and so unfortunately, um, Hansberry had lost her life early to cancer at the age of 34. Um, and so there's so much we, um, you know, still need to explore. Imani Perry's Looking for Lorraine is a great source, um, but you know she was also attacked in terms of connection to um, communism. She was activist. She was you know in these conversations as well, but um, thank you John for asking the question because we're not always thinking about um, her story and Black women's story when we're thinking about what was going on at this time, so um, more conversation is definitely needed about her life and her work. Thank you so much. And I don't want to um, direct the questions to anyone. So just feel free to just get off mute if you have something to say. Um, we posted the link to the event uh, for Dr. Green that the doc, Dr. Green mentioned on the chat. And um, let's see. Next question. It looks like it's from Ms. Uh, Quinella Williams, do you think reading White Fragility is a good book for white folks to read to help them recognize their own macro or microaggressions? I haven't, I haven't read the book, but I always say that the more you read, um, the more conversations that you can have um, about um, white privilege, right, white fragility, fragility, I, I think um, the better we are, we, we can be at, at making sure that those conversations around race are, are transparent. So we all have to be engaged in the conversation. I would never say not read. I think we have to face um, what is really going on. We have to dig deeply. And so I would, I'm all in support of, of having those conversations. Concur. Yeah. Reading as much as you possibly can, watching movies, videos, engaging in events such as this, just to have a diversity of, of thought, right? And, and discussion and helping people along the way. I want to add one of to the my... things. Oh, go I'm ahead. sorry. No, I was saying one of the things that you see um, in the New York Times is that um, so many of the books that have been published have been really geared toward nonfiction. And on one level, you can say that the audience predominantly are those who are not black, who are white. They're educating uh, white people, but those books have to be um, sold. I would just like to see um, that there be conversations across the across the across race, and that people are in dialogue with each other, because. Um, you can't have a, a one-way conversation. If you're going to write that book, make sure that you get some way to have um, interventions that involve people from different races talking about that and you get other perspectives. Because you know they would say black is in, but what is in is not black is in. Writing about the black experience is in. <laughs> 
you know, mm -hmm. so you have many people doing that. Mm -hmm. And my point connects to that. So um, Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility has gotten a lot of attention, but not just listening to um, white voices on <laughs> white fragility. So like Dr. Carol Anderson's white rage, thinking about those histories of, you know, where that, um, where white supremacy came from, I think is important to put in the conversation and getting beyond um, comfortable conversations, which, you know, white fragility frames, like, what are people comfortable hearing? What does it mean to be not uncomfortable, right? And hear the truth and deal with that. And so that needs to be um, part of the conversation too. Thank you so much. And um, somebody pointed out that I missed the question. Thank you so much. Um, so it's another question from Ms. Williams. It says, um, I believe in the film, Baldwin mentioned that we don't need numbers, we need passion. I work for a city agency. And one of the things that's slowing down the move towards equity and inclusion of black employees into management roles is lack of passion. What advice can you give me to help foster white upper management to find passion to increase equity and inclusion of the qualified Black employees? Awesome question. Thank you, Ms. Williams. I think everybody unmuted at the same time. <laughs> go ahead, you go ahead. I was just gonna say they need to be willing to give something up. So um, those who hold power, it's not just thinking about equity, but what are you willing to give up? so that someone else has access. And that's the step that I think a lot of um, upper management or senior leadership is not thinking about. What does it mean to move out of the way in order for someone else? Would you give up your position? Um, what do you have to give up uh, for, for access? I think is a question that, that has to be considered. I would like to add on to that. I mean, this is, was reading to me and maybe it's my social work bias. It sounds like a social service agency. Um, and so with the social service agency, there is the reminder that, you know, our NASW code of ethics talks about us being multicultural, meaning to get away from all these isms and to hear voices at the table that are not represented. I mean, it, it could be something it's like, well, you know, maybe we do a, a SWOT analysis or something like that. And, and one of the issues is that, you know, this is not happening um, or a, a report or a, a lot of places, and especially management, they like numbers, right? So to throw some data at them about who, who occupies what seat in management and how, you know, and, and inclusive of all the different marginalized groups that there are. So, and, and so they can sort of hold a mirror up or you're holding a mirror up to them. So a discussion can, can happen and, and maybe that might encourage them to sort of partake in, in these passionate discussions. Um, so that would be what I would recommend. But Dr. Green, it looks like you too want to add something. I just wanted to add that I think um, we can't under, un <coughs> overestimate the value of professional development workshops. And I think that you, you have to um, have that, particularly in, in an organization, you tend um, sometimes to be so focused on, on, very, on a very narrow view. And it's important to get someone from the outside to come in and to look at the structure and to get people engaged um, in, in situations where they're talking to each other, not at each other. I, I, I just want to to, to emphasize the importance of getting professional work. There are people who are experts in this field who are doing this. And I think every organization has to create some funding, some space to have that happen if they're truly committed to diversity and to dismantling those systems of sexism and, and racism and discrimination. Oh my goodness, it is eight o'clock already. We could keep talking. I see the questions keep coming, but unfortunately we're gonna um, respect everyone's time, especially our panelists who have given us an hour of their precious time today. I'm gonna hand it back to my colleague, Sandy. And for all the attendees, thank you so much for being here. We will send you a survey um, tonight about this panel and Sandy, take it away.
All right. Uh, thank you, panelists, so much for this riveting conversation. We appreciate your time, energy, and ongoing work. And thank you for I thank you everyone for attending this evening and engaging with such great questions. Um, okay, so I won't keep us uh, for too much longer. We uh, just want to announce that our film for February will be Teach Us All. It is available on Canopy for free to all students. Our, co our corresponding panel will be titled Perpetuating White Supremacy. It will be held on February 21st at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Please look out for the panelist lineup and the registration link um, in your Fordham newsletter, on our Instagram page, and on our Facebook page. As promised, if you're interested in getting involved with the IDA committee or student congress or just want to stay up to date on events, we're on Instagram, Facebook, Slack, or you can just email us and we will be and we have uh, just dropped all this information in chat. Again, the panelists, thank you so much for your time this evening and everyone um, have a safe and lovely evening. Thank you. Thank Bye, you everyone. so much. Thank you, thank you. so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.